Uh, that's, that's exactly what, what happened to me. I was like, I'm going to run 250 miles in body armor. And that thing was like, dude, you're not capable of that. You're goddamn right. I'm not capable of that. So I need to level up. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Lionheart Radio with your host, Rick Alexander. Today is a bonus episode, so I don't have any guests today, so you're just stuck with me. You and I, we're going to talk about life. So for those of you that follow me in my particular journey, you know that uh, I'm getting ready to do a pretty big run, and I've done some pretty big runs and stuff like that in the past. Um, Last year I ran 200 miles around Lake Tahoe, raised a bunch of money for the Heroes Project. Uh, Then following that, we did the 100 bikes or bust. Basically, I rode a stationary bike for 205 miles, and we raised enough money to buy 150 bikes for kids whose parents couldn't afford them. And we got helmets for them as well, and we gave them out um, at Christmas time. And that was a really, really cool project. That was actually the catalyst, probably like a turning point in my life. And then this year, uh, I'm getting ready to run 247 miles nonstop and self-supported from Fort Bragg, North Carolina to Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I'm going to do it in body armor. And there are so many uh, sort of intricate details on why. And I keep getting asked, why are you doing this? Or how are you doing this? How are you training for it? How are you preparing for it mentally, physically? And so I actually already recorded a full episode where I break all of that stuff down. Uh, And toward the end of the episode, I started thinking about it and I was editing it. And I, I just kept thinking about how people, they always, for whatever reason, these really kind of big physical endeavors that you take on, they have a, a ripple effect and they have they capture a lot of people's attention and people want to know why or how. How the hell are you possibly doing this? And I don't know that they necessarily want to know the nuts and bolts how, um, but more or less, like how is it that humans are capable of doing things like this that, are, that seem beyond the uh, comprehension of most people? And I'm of the firm belief that Right now, if you're listening to this, you can be, do, or have, create whatever it is that you want in this life. I don't think it'll be given to you, and I don't think it'll be easy, uh, and it might be much, much, much harder than you suspect it even will be, but that doesn't mean I don't think that you're capable of it, and it doesn't mean that I don't think that I'm capable of it, and uh, that mindset has carried me a super long way, because I don't think that people want to know how are you how are you doing this from a physiological standpoint? Some people certainly do, but, but how are you doing these things in general? And then, and then I think the bigger why behind asking me how is because they want to know if they could do things similar to this. And the answer is absolutely yes. I'm not uh, a good, I'm not like an insane athlete. I'm not an elite athlete. I'm not, I'm just a dude that knows exactly what's he, what he wants in this life and is going to get it. And if you can somehow foster that mindset, I am quite confident that you can do the same thing. And so what I wanted to do is talk about how I'm going to do this event, why I'm doing this event, and I want to pull out all of the things along the way that I think you could benefit from it, uh, because I want to see you do really big things in this life. And I think deep down, that's also what you want. All right. So, uh, Man, we got to talk about alignment. We can't actually talk about doing anything really big or really cool uh, without talking about alignment first. And when I say alignment, I mean you doing the things that you feel called to do in this lifetime. And that is maybe it gets a little woo woo. It's kind of whatever. I thought about this a lot because I feel like I'm finally on this path where I'm doing all of the things in life that I was meant to do, that I was put here to do. And I've thought. Uh, earnestly about this idea because what if you don't believe that? What if you don't believe that humans were put here for some purpose? You're more of a determinist and you just think that, um, you know, especially if you ascribe to Darwin's theory, it's essentially random chance, right? Um, That that's what uh, natural selection is, right? It's, uh, you know, random mutations combined with survival of the fittest. And so if you're very deterministic and you don't believe that you were put here for a certain reason, does that matter? 
to me, I've thought about that a lot because I actually don't know where I fall on this issue. It, on this issue. Um, but I don't think that it actually does matter. I think whether you uh, believe that a higher power put you here in order to do something big with this life or you give it that meaning, where you're coming from doesn't matter. But what does matter is that your life actually does have that meaning. Um, most people believe that they were not put here to pay bills and die. Uh, most, most people believe that there's something, some gift that they have, some interest that they have, some thing that they have that they can offer the world. And one of the things that I believe is, you know, we all go through these unique experiences in life. And it can be very easy to want to compare uh, your experiences to someone else and to think that and to dismiss what you've gone through. Um, but the thing is, when you're talking about especially hard times, when you're talking about pain, when you're talking about going through things in life, the comparison game actually doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter at all. What matters is that you own your pain, right? So the fact that you're going through a really bad breakup right now and that shit hurts really bad, the fact that somebody else is going through um, a cancer diagnosis and that might be way worse in the broad scheme of things doesn't mean that it hurts you less, right? And that's what we have to get away from. We can't dismiss the things we've gone through because the things that we go through in this life are exactly what's going to position us in order to do something great going forward. And so you have to, you have to come to the point, what you have to realize is that your unique perspective positions you uniquely to talk about that thing in a way that other people can't. And there's other people that are going through hard times. And this is what defines a great life, in my opinion, because nobody is going to be uh, sheltered from difficult times, uh, from depression, from diagnosis, from breakups, from tragedy and loss. Like nobody gets to be sheltered from these things. But the thing that's going to determine whether, in my opinion, your life uh, it sort of goes in vain or not, is whether you can shoulder these experiences and then who you become on the other side of them. Because that's how great things happen in life. You, When you get exposed to something really hard, you have to decide beforehand how you're going to react. Are you the kind of person that's going to fold inward or not? And I know I talk about this a lot on the show, but I really think it's so important. You know, I was a, a BUDS instructor for uh, almost four years, and I had tons and tons of students that wanted to be Navy SEALs and Navy SWIC. And one of the things I would always talk about, talk to them about is the fact that something in this training pipeline is going to be really, really difficult for you. <clears throat> maybe you're a good runner, and maybe it's the swimming that gets you. Maybe it's vice versa. Maybe you're good at both of those, but the obstacle courses get you. Maybe the log PT gets you. Maybe the treading water gets you, even though you can swim. Maybe you're a stud athlete. All that's fine. But then the uh, grind gets you. There are so many built-in uh, stimuli. There's so many built-in stress. There's so much built-in stress that... There's going to be something here that is really hard for you, and it's designed that way. We're not necessarily looking for D1 athletes that can run, um, that are great runners in soft sand. It's the fact that soft sand creates a really stressful environment, and we want to know if you're the kind of guy that when his back gets against the wall, when everything hurts, are you the kind of person that folds inward, or are you the kind of person that runs through a fucking brick wall? And that's what we're looking for here. Right, And so that's the conversation I would have with students. Now, that's a very acute uh, stress response that they're being exposed to. But that doesn't mean no matter what you're doing in life, you're going to be exposed to these stresses. Like we said, that's just the way that life is. One conversation can change your entire life for the positive or for the negative. One diagnosis, one breakup, one tragedy, one loss, one whatever can just throw you into chaos. And on the other side of that chaos, you have to find out, you have to ask yourself who you're going to be. And you have to ask yourself before you go into it. Because once you find yourself in chaos, there's nothing to grab onto. And so you need to know who you are going to be so that you make those decisions on autopilot when everything hurts, when it's stressful, when it sucks. Some of the greatest things in this lifetime have come on the other side of tragedy. Um, you can look at Lance Armstrong because he's such a, well, it's a little bit of a polarizing issue, but he's such a good person to think about this with, right? Because he was diagnosed with stage four uh, 
testicle cancer, and the cancer had metastasized and spread all over his body, including into his brain. His chan- He had a 90% chance of dying, they said, or 85% chance. And that, I mean, as a pro cyclist, as really like kind of living your, your best life, you know, at that point felt like he was, to be diagnosed with that is pretty much, I've got to imagine, is as low as you could possibly get. And he chose to fight. He was the kind of person that doesn't fold inward. And, and that doesn't mean he didn't have a moment where he felt bad for himself. I say that all the time. Like, it's okay to just stop and acknowledge it, you know. In, in next week's podcast with uh, Megan Cannon, the psychologist, we talk about that. Like, it's okay to just acknowledge what you're going through sucks and to just sit with it for a minute. But you need to know, are you the kind of person that's going to take that experience and do something great with it? And so I think that is really important that you come to that conclusion because uh, after beating it, you know, obviously Lance Armstrong went on to raise hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for cancer, but more importantly, that like personally impact people with cancer. Um, they, that would read his book that they would inspire to keep fighting to, that's how you do something great. You take the kind of just bullshit that life hands you and, and then you figure out some way to come out the other side of it with some semblance of meaning, right? And that's what gives our lives meaning. We have to, we have to like assign meaning to these things. Otherwise, to do something great is going to be super difficult. And that's the first way you can go to, to do something great. Now, life might not, you know, hopefully not hand you cancer. And it might not hand you um, a devastating diagnosis or tragedy or loss. I think at some point, you know, nobody's really can protect themselves forever from those things. But, you know, we see a lot of motivational speakers that have gone through something really difficult. And then because of that, on the other side of that, they have this amazing story. And that's kind of what, what I've been alluding to this entire time. But there's, there's another way you can go about doing great things in this life, and that's to find your hard times and to pursue them, to find your struggle. So that's like a talk that I've been giving a lot right now. I don't want to give that whole talk right now, but it's this idea that you can find discomfort, you can find struggle, and you can go to it. You don't have to wait for it to come to you. You can find the difficult parts of life and you can meet it on its own terms, right? That's what we're doing when we're running ultra marathons or we're working out or we're striving for something. We're finding our struggle and we're going to it because we know that greatness is only going to be bred on the other side of that struggle. And there's really no getting around that in life, right? You, you're never going to do something amazing without some sort of sacrifice, right? Because a sacrifice, what you're doing when you sacrifice going out and drinking with your friends or you sacrifice sleep or you set, whatever you're sacrificing, that's a deal. You're making a deal with the future. You're making a deal that the person that you're going to be in the future is going to be better than the person that you are right now. And what that deal requires of you is sacrifice. And so it's super important to recognize that whether life hands you really hard times Um, in some big cataclysmic event, or you find your own struggle and you pursue it, uh, it, it's important to realize that regardless, if you want to do great things in this life, you have to find your struggle. And that's what I've done with the endurance stuff. That's it. It's something that has aligned with me, right? It was the struggle that I find that I'm uniquely positioned to fight. I know for sure. Now, if you need a guy to run really fast, I'm not your dude. You need a guy to be really strong. I'm also not your guy. You need a guy to put it in second gear and just suffer for hours, for days, to never quit. I can do that shit all day long. Like, that's what I do. Like, I figured that out about myself. And so I found that was my way to put a dent in the universe. Um, And you can find that about yourself, too. It doesn't have to be this, like, long-suffering thing. And also, too, when you talk about, like, really great things in life, it's a process. You don't start running 247 miles in body armor or 205 miles around Lake Tahoe. You start with a 5K. You start with a 10K. You start with what's relatively hard for you. You find your struggle, and you keep pulling that thread. And as you pull that thread, you're going to find more and more things that align with you and things that don't. And when you find the things that don't, you just get rid of them because you don't have time for that shit in your life. We only have a certain amount of time on this earth, and you know that. But what we don't think about is the fact that Let's say the average lifespan is like 76 years old. And I just completely made that up. I think it's around that. Well, the actual time that you have 
to be in the prime to like fulfill your ultimate potential is even smaller, right? Because up till 20, you're pretty much just learning through a fire hose. And there reaches a certain point, and I don't know where that point is, I'm not there yet, but there reaches a certain point where you start to decline in your potential as well, at least physically, probably cognitively as well. So man, when you're in it, you gotta wring all of the life you can out of that certain, that small window, out of that moment. You need to figure that out. Uh, You need to make sure that you capitalize on that. You gotta strike while the iron's hot. Right, And so the way that you do that, though, is you keep finding these struggles. You find the struggles that align with you. And the ones that don't, fuck, man, you get rid of them. People are like, dude, I just hate running. Cool, man, then hate running. Just don't fucking run. Like, I don't care. But there's some kind of struggle that you're born and bred for. I guarantee it. That's what we evolved to do. Humans got here. We fought and clawed our way to the top of the food chain. The reason you have all these survival mechanisms and biological baggage, dude, they're left over from clawing our way to the top of the food chain. You were born to struggle, I guarantee goddamn it. And so you gotta find yours and you gotta find your interest because the person that you have the potential to be is going to be on the other side of your unique struggle. And what happens is you start to find this struggle, and then you you look down the road and you figure out where it could go. So for me, when I started running and I, I first did my first 50 miler, I started looking further down the road. I thought like, where does this lead? And what that does is it gives you something to orient yourself toward, right? It's a North Star for your efforts. And that's really important because if you have all of the effort in the world without direction, you'll never be able to do anything great because it will go everywhere. I know for sure because I have really bad ADD and that's my life. (laughs) So you have to find a thing to orient yourself toward. You have to find um, a personal mission. And if you don't, and I know it sounds cliche because everybody talks about finding their why right now, but you have to find a thing that you can orient yourself towards and finding a personal mission statement like I want to make people, I want to do this in the world, that gives you something to orient yourself toward. And then all of the other things that come along, they either work in that mission statement or they don't. And if they don't, you can easily say no. Like I think one of the things that we have a lot of trouble with in this life is saying no. We want to say yes to everything. We want to please people. We want to never miss out on opportunity. Um, but the problem with that is if you pursue every single opportunity that comes your your way, especially if you're out in the world doing big things, a lot of opportunities will come. If you do that, you're going to end up in so many different directions that doing one thing great is actually going to be really difficult. And I know because I've spelt, spent so much time saying yes to things. And when you get really secure in your mission and your alignment and you figure out what it is that you were here to do on this earth, whether you give yourself that meaning or you think it comes from a higher purpose, when you figure that out, you can like say no and you can stand on that no because it's not a malicious thing. It's not a, I don't want to do that. It's a, that doesn't fit with my mission and so that I don't have time for it because the thing that I'm doing in this world is so goddamn big. It requires so much of me that I can't give myself to all of these other petty pursuits in the process, right? And so there's a certain nobility in being able to say no to things that come your way. And so that's the next thing, you gotta orient yourself toward something, toward a mission, come up with a mission statement. Hit me up, dude, hit me up on Instagram at Rick Alexander underscore, and I'll help you craft a mission statement. I will tell you exactly how I did mine, and I will give you resources, and because I really think that it's the most important thing for you to do, um, to find your purpose in life, but also to find a way to start doing bigger things, to live bigger, to live more boldly. Now, the other thing I want to say about this, uh, this process of uh, finding really big things in life is that when you come up with your mission statement, there should be a certain amount of, I don't know how I'm going to ever get this done. Like there's a little bit, of, there's fear involved if you think big enough. Um, I know when I think about my, my personal mission and my personal goals in life, they scare the living shit out of me. Like really they scare me. When I per- first published my book, I can't even tell you how nervous I was about it. Um, and I'm not somebody that typically gets nervous in situations like that. But all of a sudden I had this paralyzing fear when I realized the entire world could read my thoughts and tell me that they were garbage. And so um, 
I sort of, I had to sit with that fear for a long time. It actually took me a couple months to work through that process because I really want to be a writer and a content producer. And if that's the thing that you really want to be, you have to get over that fear. But I guess I just want to point that out because as you're thinking about yours, it's okay if you're not there yet, right? Your mission should be part, uh, part pragmatic and part aspirational. Like, who do you want to be in this world? That's the point of a mission. It's to orient yourself toward. It's not what you're, where you already are. And that's really important that, that you think about it in those terms so that you don't let fear back you into a corner and so that you don't play it too small. Because if you want to do great things in life, you got to go big, right? You got to take risk. You got to take calculated risk. But man, there's a chance that I get somewhere between Fort Bragg and Virginia Beach and the wheels blow the fuck off, right? I'm trying to do so many things here. I'm trying to do it self-supported. Um, I'm trying to do it in body armor. Like there's a lot of variables. I'm doing my best to account for every single one of them. And that's what I'll get into next, kind of breaking down the process. But there's a level of risk there like that I just can't do much about. Three in the morning, I get hit by a truck. Like That's a real thing that could happen. Um, you have to get to the point where the risk of what could go wrong pales in comparison to the reward of what could go right. And that's basically the point I'm at with this run. All right. And so then the last part, once you kind of start to figure out what you want, you pursue your interests, you start to craft your mission statement and define your purpose in life and you start to level up you start to to pick something big there's going to be a thing that happens in the back of your brain you're going to get what's called imposter syndrome and it's this idea that there's uh somewhere in your head there's a fear around what you're doing and that that fear is telling you you're not good enough people will tell you you can't listen to that fear that's actually not the tact that i take i think that fear is put somewhere for a reason. It's trying to tell you something. You know what? You're right. You're not good enough. Uh, that's, that's exactly what, what happened to me. I was like, I'm going to run 250 miles in body armor. And that thing was like, dude, you're not capable of that. You're goddamn right. I'm not capable of that. So I need to level up. I need to train. I need to become more of an athlete. I need to become stronger. I need my midline stability to be stronger. I need my posterior chain to be on point. I need my erectors to be stronger. Like, no, I'm not good enough. And that's okay. It's not, you're not supposed to be good enough as soon as you decide I'm going to go do that. Now, as a human, you're good enough. But do you have the, you know, at your essence, you're good enough. You're, you're, you were put here for a reason. This dream was put in your heart for a reason. So for those, for if you look at it in that light, of course you're good enough. But like, you know, physically, emotionally, physiology, you might not be good enough and that's okay. The, it's, the answer isn't, oh, I'm scared, don't do this. The answer is, oh, I'm scared, I gotta figure out how to do this. I need to account for every risk possible. I need to minimize the downside of this thing not working out. And that's what I mean when I say take a pragmatic approach to breaking down the process. So with this run, I had to figure out what are the things that I'm really good at, right? Let's, it's like an asset and a liability column. In the assets, I put all of the things that I currently have that will help me get through this. My mindset, I'm pretty good at suffering, asset. My um, lungs, huge asset. There's no way I'll be able to run fast enough um, past my cardiovascular capability, huge asset. Um, my legs are strong and I was a lot heavier of a runner last year than I am this year. Last year I weighed about 225 pounds when I did my 200 miler. I'm about 197 right now. Huge advantage when, I, when I'm adding weight at a body armor. Uh, disadvantage, uh, I barely wear body armor anymore because I'm transitioning out of the military. Uh, so I'm not gonna be ready for it. Um, I'm not good at road running. I'm much better at trail running. I'm better in the hills than I am in the flats and this is gonna be flat side of the road. Um, I'm not good when I have nothing to look at. I like to have scenery, so that's another liability. So basically, you come up with all of these liabilities, and then you start coming up with a plan to speak to them. You don't, and to do that, you might need some help, especially if what you're trying to do that's great is physical, then does it make sense to hire a coach? Yeah, absolutely. Like I've talked to a ton of mindset coaches. Even though I consider myself to be pretty mentally strong, I want to minimize every risk that I possibly can. I want to figure this thing out. And so I just pragmatically break it down. You make an asset and a liability column. What do you have that's going to get you toward being 
doing, having, creating this great thing that you want to do in life? And what's going to detract from that right now? And the more of the, those liabilities that you can speak to, the more of the things that are going to detract away from it are, you can take away. Well, shit, man, that's less fear that you're going to have around that process while also increasing the probability that that thing that you want to do in life is going to be successful, right? So I think it's really easy for us to step back and look at doing something big in life. Um, right now, for me, that would be this because that's relatively big for me. That's the other thing. Like, remember, big for you is relative. And it's going, you're going to level up as you do. And every time you do, you're going to get better. And as long as you follow the steps, as long as you, you speak to your liabilities and you pragmatically break down the process and you train hard, you're going to level up. You're going to get better. You just got to do your due diligence in order to give yourself the best chance at success. And then five years from now, what's big for you is going to be so much bigger than what's big for you now. And that's when people stand around and they ask, like, how are you capable of that? I'll tell you how, because I've been fucking at this for five years. I've been working my nuts off trying to be the best possible version of me that I can be, right? And so you break down that process. You find your struggle, and then you just start working toward it. And you start leveling up, and you start becoming a better human in the process. You start becoming a more capable human in the process. And that's how you're going to do really, really big things in this life. All right. So the last thing I want to do is because I got um, a bunch of Q&A stuff on Instagram, I'm actually going to go through those, um, and I will answer them as they relate to, uh, to this run. All right. So Rachel Rianne on Instagram said... Do your toenails ever grow back the same or not? Nah? The answer is they do, and I wish that they fucking wouldn't. Um, every single time I do one of these runs, if it's over 100K, I'm losing all my toenails. The problem is I don't lose them right then and there, maybe one or two, but they die. And so then over the process of the next two or three months, I literally lose toenails here and there randomly. And if you want to like really wreck some close relationships in your life, have your girlfriend watch you accidentally pick your big toenail off in the middle of the night. Um, that's how those things happen. So yes, they grow back and not, nah, I wish that they didn't. <laughs> All right, let's see. Ben Matlock nine on Instagram says, start and end points when Fort Bragg, North Carolina to Virginia Beach, Virginia. Oh, and if you guys want to run some of this with me, I'm going to break these up into like 10 mile legs. I would ask if you do want to run with me, run at least 10 miles, but I would invite everybody to come out and uh, I would love to have you guys uh, run some of it with me, finish with me, come to the after party, be involved, whatever. I want this thing to be as big as I possibly can. You know, this is my sort of dent in the universe right now. So I'd love to have you guys. Nomad Life on Instagram says, what's the chafing like? I'll be honest, I've had some really, really, really bad chafing in my life. Uh, I won't get into it because I'll lose a, probably a ton of listeners if I described how gnarly it really is. Um, but I will say I've worked really hard over the last couple of years to make my legs smaller to reduce chafing, and it's actually worked. I used to squat three times a week. Um, I only squat once a week now. Um, I do a lot more body weight stuff, and that sucks to lose some numbers on the bar, but for me not dealing with this just epic proportion level of chafing is worth it. So I'm hoping the chafing is not too bad. It might be, it might get that way. I'm mentally expecting it to get that way, but I know in Lake Tahoe actually didn't get too bad. All right. As to board, that's uh, my buddy Aaron on Instagram, and he is an awesome ultra runner. He has made intensely good progress over the last year. How do you condition your nipples? I don't have, my nipples are fine, man. They don't get really wrecked in these things. I don't know why. It's some people, like in the marathon, you see them bleeding through. I think I've maybe had nipple chafing one time. Now that I'm saying that, Murphy will probably come screw me over, but I don't know, Band-Aids? I guess under body armor it might be bad, but I'll probably know before then. All right, Jimmy went fit on Instagram said, how do you overcome leg cramps in the middle of a race? Okay, so my process is... Salt, uh, salt licks and Tums. People don't know about Tums usually. Everybody usually does the salt thing. So I do electrolytes with noon tablets, bone broth, and coconut water. And then I alternate between salt licks and Tums. The only time I went all salt licks and I didn't eat enough Tums, uh, if you drink salt and drink water all day long in the sun, 
you are going to have explosive diarrhea. And that was the life that I was faced with. Um, so now I alternate. I eat a lot of Tums. Tums have high magnesium content and a couple other things that help stave off cramps. And I'll tell you, like, people don't even always believe this, but I've been in full-on leg lockup mode where my legs literally won't move. And I've taken, like, four Tums, just eaten four Tums. Within three minutes, I can get my legs to start moving again. So that's something I would recommend that you put into your routine. All right, how are you fueling? Oh, Jenny, the nutritionist. You guys know Jenny. She's been on the show a couple times. She's interviewed me on the show. She's hosted the show. Um, fantastic nutrition company that she runs, and uh, I would highly suggest you guys check that out. I think it's like JennyTheNutritionist.com or something. But she said, how are you fueling yourself for this during training and during the run? It's a hot with a wink face. Okay, so for me, I... I ascribe to this notion of diet. You guys agree with it or disagree with it. Endurance athletes, I, it works for me. It's worked for most of my clients. I treat the following as if, let me, let me rewind. So what I do is I take carbohydrates, I take caffeine, and I take any kind of anti-inflammatory, and I get rid of them completely from my diet, my routine, and my life. The reason I do that, everyone's like, oh, you go to carb load. All right, bro, got it. But what I like to do is make myself very, uh, one, insulin. I don't want to be insulin resistant. I want to be very receptive to insulin. I want to be very receptive to fuel sources. And so when I take them out of my life, I'm, do, I'm someone that does well training without carbohydrates and caffeine. Like I can train really well. I literally give myself just enough to get by to train. So I've got a formula for how many carbs I take when I do really long runs when I'm training. Um, and then that way I know that when I go to use them during the event, they're there for me. Uh, it, you know, I've had races where I didn't do that. And sometimes you turn into this just animal that cannot get enough carbohydrates and caffeine. And you end up on a roller coaster because you'll eat a shitload of sugar and gummy bears and carbs and caffeine and you'll spike up. And then the crash is even harder. And then you need more. So then you, you just end up on this sort of like like in a pendulum, basically going back and forth on energy levels. And that is a really hard thing to manage over days of running. And so what I do is I get to the point where I'm so uh, sensitive to carbohydrates that like a couple powdered donuts literally last me hours. And like I said, I mean, it doesn't, I do think it would probably work for most people. I understand that most people don't want to go without carbohydrates while they're endurance training, but it works for me. It's worked for my clients. So that's the way that I do it. Um, as far as heat, I'm not that great with dealing with heat when I run. I mean, I'm going to just really have to increase the electrolytes. One of the things that happens with heat that people sort of screw up, I guess, when they're running is they end up overhydrating and they don't have enough electrolytes. So what they do is they fl flush all the electrolytes out of their cells and then that makes them feel dehydrated. So then they drink even more water and it turns into this like feedback loop of them constantly actually screwing themselves by drinking more and more water. And I've ended up like that in like two different ultras I remember that were really hot. Um, so that will be a battle for me and it's something I'm training. I'm also, I hit the sauna a lot now. Like I'll train and then I'll go straight into the sauna for as long as I can stand it. And that seems to help too. All right, what kinds of things do you take to do, or what kinds of, let's see, Doc Pate on Instagram said, Doc Pate on Instagram said, what kinds of things do you have to do to take care of your feet? All right, so this is uh, really interesting. So when they, um, when I got the email for the Tahoe 200, they said, have a, Candace Burt, the race director, said, have a pair of shoes that is a half a size too big so when your feet swell, you can change into them. And I thought, nope, not going to buy a $200 pair of shoes that's a half a size too big. Uh, and the one thing I should have done that I didn't do was that because what happened is about 150 miles into it, you know, I take my shoes off as much as I can to deal with stuff. The last thing you want to do is let a little thing go in an ultra because it's so long that little things become big things. A pebble in your shoe can become a hip problem for the next 20 years if you don't get rid of it because it'll change your gait. That little change in stride over a super long period of time will put you in a bad position. So I would take my shoes off and they had a great medical staff. So I was, you know, super gluing my toes together and fixing my blisters and doing all those good things that I had to do. And at about 150 miles, I think it was, my feet got so swollen, I couldn't get them out of my shoe anymore. So then I had a decision to make. I could cut my shoes off um, or 
and then I would have to basically tape them to wear them again, or I could just keep my feet in there and run it as is. I chose to run it as is when retrospect, I probably should have just bit the bullet and cut my shoes um, or brought better sho- or bigger shoes from the start. But basically what happened is because my foot was in there, we had water crossings and I had a ton of blood in there from blisters breaking and stuff. I got some like pretty gnarly trench foot because it was still like another, you know, I don't know, almost day and a half of not being able to take my shoe off. So the way that I'm going to take care of my feet is very carefully and I'm going to have um, an extra pair of shoes for sure. All right. Ty Lift Hunt Life on Instagram said, how do you plan to condition your hips, knees, ankles, and feet for the added weight? All right, so um, as I mentioned, I was much heavier in my career last year as a runner than I am this year. So that's actually a huge advantage that I have. Uh, Basically, um, my added body armor is almost my body weight last year. So a lot of stuff, like my uh, soft tissue uh, joints, tendons, all of that stuff, they're actually pretty well conditioned and pretty strong for the added weight. But the one way that I take care of that with me and with all my clients is always with strength training. I think strength training is invaluable to the endurance athlete. I've preached that a ton on here, but the reason is uh, you can mimic a lot of the stimulus. I can do barbell step-ups or front rack loaded with a kettlebell step-ups, things like that that are not going to expose your body to a ton of pounding, but you're going to get a lot of soft tissue recruitment and uh, thus strength built up in those areas. And so that is why. Okay, I think that's the last question I had. I might have had a couple more that I missed, but I would encourage you guys, if you have questions about this stuff, um, I I fucking love talking about this. So hit me up. Hit me up at Lionheart Radio on Instagram or at Rick Alexander underscore on Instagram. If you have questions about the event, if you want to get involved, if you want to run with me, um, or, and this is something... uh, I really love to talk about if you have something that you want to do really big in this life, I would love to talk to you about how you can get that done. I do a ton of coaching um, or if it's simply a conversation or point you at some resources, I'll do anything I can because I guarantee I have because I am of the firm belief that you are capable of so many cool things in this lifetime. I want my life, the things that I'm doing to serve as an example of those things. Um, but I would love to help you do them for yourself. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this bonus episode. As always, if you could, shoot over iTunes and give us a five-star rating. I'm going all in on the podcast thing, on on my dream of creating content. And when we have reviews, it really helps us to climb the rankings. And when we do that, we'll be able to get more listeners and more money for the show, yada, yada. We'll be able to get the message out. Everything is good. Please go to iTunes, give us a review, and I will love you long time. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, Send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <sighs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest nigga be the coldest. Cleveland.